is Conrad Hall there? And they, some guy who had answered, who was a grip or whatever, said, yeah, yeah, he, Connie's here, yeah. And I said, I can I talk to him? And, hey, Connie, you got a phone call. Right? So, <laughs> and I said, hi. He said, listen, you don't know me. I'm this film, you know, new guy, and I was a film student. I have some questions. He said, oh, okay, listen, I can't talk too much on the phone. Why don't you come down to the come studio down to the set. and we'll, we'll talk a little bit. We're here in the uh, in King Edward's uh, ca castle, um, which has been graciously moved brick by brick to New Haven, Connecticut, where we're actually nowhere near the set of Mr. Dean Cundy's latest film. Simply put, one of the greatest cinematographers in the history of the medium, a man who's been able wow. to work consistently at all scales, large and small, and has shot some of the greatest films ever made. Thank you for joining us. Ah, well, my pleasure, especially after that intro. intro. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I just wish you could tell that to my wife. I, I will well, give me your her email and I'll send it right over. No, I'll good. let her know. So when the, when you look in the annals of, of yeah. uh, horror movie history. Uh -huh. You got, um, those are our extras, by the way. Yeah. We, we paid. Can yeah. you guys go back to ones? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what are you doing before Halloween? You're, you're, you've got a series of pictures, a host of pictures. Uh, I did uh, Where the Red Fern Grows, which yeah. was uh, kind of an accepted movie, uh, it, a book that every junior high school kid had to read, so. Right. It had uh, some credibility, but it was, you know, kind of a smallish hit. Right. I had also at that time been doing Satan's Cheerleaders. Satan's Cheerleaders. Satan's Cheerleaders. Yeah. Which was see. that Satan. was that was sounds like a very straight drama. Is she the unsoiled maiden? Is she the one chosen to be your bride? Are you kidding, man? I'm no maiden. I've been a cheerleader for three years. It was, it was yeah. a little meaningful family film. Right. <laughs> A lot of the early films I was doing were, were, you know, low budget, very small uh, schedules. Right. It was a case of using the camera to record the actors talking. Right. And then we'd use the camera to record some cars blowing up. <laughs> right. And, and then uh, you'd cut them together. Right? Yeah, and it would right. be cut together. I used the films um, for my own selfish purposes to, uh, to learn how to make uh, short uh, schedules, how do you light uh, a, a room with only three lights, I would challenge myself, to right. something like that. I had uh, done, I guess, three or four films that Deborah Hill had been the script supervisor on. Uh -huh. Interesting. And, uh, it, was, it was actually the script supervisor that introduced you to... Yeah, so uh, Deborah went to John and, and then came to me and suggested that we might be a good team, you know, that we had similar sensibilities. So Halloween was the calling card for both of us, a variety of us. And I was delighted to discover that John was a great visual storyteller. He was interested in using the camera, composition, lighting, all the stuff, to the same extent that I was, to you know create mood and emotional yep. response in the audience. And yep. So it turned into uh, a, a great you know, adventure for me, um, and uh, a, a great result because uh, it was a movie that was more than the, you know, some of, of its parts. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the actual photography in the mm -hmm. movie because it is so, you know, there's a few sequences that you can't, once you've seen the movie, you can't forget. Mm -hmm. You just, you don't forget. The opening sequence, as Michael as a child is slowly hunting down his own sister. All of this in one shot or were there some hidden edits in there? No, yeah, uh, well there's one hidden edit, but we shot it all in one shot. And that was really uh, just sort of to blend together, you know, two takes, one that had a better beginning and one that had a better ending. Did but you yourself operate that shot? Yeah, um, but we, we shared that it was a new camera at the time, the Panaglide, the camera support system. The Panaglide, which was the uh, the equivalent of the Steadicam, right. which is such a, it's a u very ubiquitous tool uh, now. Now, John saw it as, as a great way to do, you know, the visual storytelling, and um, you know, I 
concurred completely. Did you know that you were going to be <coughs> from the POV of Michael? Uh, yeah, we had talked about it, and we, you know, had extensive conversation about what's the best way, and um, holding the camera handheld um, is, is effective in some ways, but um, we were looking for a way for the camera to, you know, glide, glide. through yeah. the scenes in the, the story. The camera moves through the house, through the backyard and through the house in one direction, um, and then comes out another. And we were also, we would look through the window of right. the house and into a room. The camera would then walk into that same room. By the time the camera came into that room, uh, all of those lights had to be moved, some of them taken out. So it, it was amusing to, to hear the shot being done because we would glide up, we'd look through the window, uh -huh. And then the camera would move on, and I could hear the guys. All the guys moving lights. Out. Okay, get, you get that one. I'll unplug <laughs> it. No, unplug it. No, unplug it. shot over the shoulder of Michael as he's driving is just one of the scariest. Like, you could be sitting in the theater, you could walk into the movie at that point, and it's, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What was it about that? It, it was a very sort of voyeuristic film, obviously. Right. You know, we, we were watching as an audience, uh, and then sometimes we were... Uh, Michael Myers watching as, you know, the killer. Um, so you, you didn't quite know which one you were. To a certain extent, you could identify with Michael. Uh, Michael. He, he, you know, was such an obvious threat, and uh, which, which was one of those things that I think uh, John and, and I subsequently learned is that uh, how do you make a character a threat? It was a very delicate balance between uh, implying that you were, you know, the killer, the killer, and um, still, or sick. you know, more more correctly, I would just say, uh, is that you were lurking outside with the, the killer. killer next Over to the killer. Over his shoulder. Yeah. You know, it's so. interesting because at the end of that <laughs> shot, he sort of drives off and past, mm -hmm. and it sort of pulls back to show more of Michael driving. Right. And at that point, you are, you know, you're, you're, you're unable to control him. You know, you, you, yeah. he's peeking, you're peeking. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of that shot, it drives off. And, you know, you're, you're like, well, I'm, I'm not driving this car. He is. Mm -hmm. And right. I don't know what he's going to do. Right. I have to ask because it is one of the, one of, it's one of the, the greatest images in cinema history. The closet, the light pouring in, the hand tearing away at the wooden slats. Mm -hmm. When you were making that, were you just looking through the lens going, wow, this is going to scare the shit out of people? You sort of learn the mechanics. You think about how do you scare the right. audience. Right. The third uh, time, in other words. Or the fifth time, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, yeah. you know, they go to the closet and there's the sound and they go and they, and they open and the cat jumps out, right? Right. How many times have we seen that? Right. 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 And there's this startle and then you know, the audience goes, oh, phew, it's only the cat. And then the character turns, and there's the killer. There's certain mechanical things that we know sort of work. Work. But when I go see a horror film, you know, I, it's like, you know, you, if you, you were... You see their tricks. If you were a magician, right, right, um, as, as I was as a kid, right, um, and you stood backstage, right, right, you would say, oh, yeah, well, That's... Got, there's a guy running into the other box, and... You know, you sort of watch a film and say, oh, I see what they're doing. The camera's this and a trick here, and oh, he's going to scare us now. And yes, he did. Over a period of time as a, as a kid, you know, you sort of learn the tricks. There were very few films that scared me except 
the Body Snatchers, the uh, Kevin McCarthy movie yep. with the yep. aliens the and the, the, the pod, and it uh, foamed up. And uh, as a kid, I was probably 12 years old. Um, I remember waking up in the middle of the night. Terrified. There was a pod in my room, <laughs> and it was going to take over my brain. And what? Oh wait. Oh no. Well, that was stupid of me to put my coat on the floor. You know. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. Well, as we were making Halloween, you just sort of say, oh, well, that should be an interesting shot. You know, one of my, you know, kind of favorite things is Jamie Lee upstairs. She thinks she's safe. She's, uh, yep. and slowly Michael Myers becomes visible in the closet next to her. Right. That was a case of, uh, you know, John saying, well, how can we make it so that we can't see them, and then it seems like our eyes are getting used to the dark, right? And we see, so I had a little light <clears throat> with a, a snoot, which is something that confines it just to a very small spot, on a dimmer. You know, I lit it dark enough so you couldn't see Michael, Michael in the closet, and then just slowly brought the dimmer up till he became visible. And, wow. and, you know, the audience who is concentrating on Jamie Lee and not seeing in anything in the closet suddenly becomes aware of the fact that he's lurking there. So those are the and that, and that just, when you saw it in the theater with an audience, probably just... Oh, yeah. They were, you know, because you can hear an audience react. That's, that's the fun part is when the audience reacts to a film right. you're, you're working on. And, yep. and they would, you know, just be this intake of breath and this, oh, no, and this, oh, look out, and, you know. Fantastic. Those are the kind of fun things to uh, to create something like that and see how it works. Halloween is unquestionably an epic horror film, a, a scary movie that changed the game. But The Thing is on mm. many people's lists of the scariest movies ever made in a different way, mm -hmm. in a very different way. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about shooting the movie, about what you wanted to do photographically well, with that? Well, Rob Bottin yep. was a, um, uh, a great influence on it because he was doing such unusual creature stuff. Right. It was somewhere between makeup and special effects. So um, the idea was to show just enough of Rob's creations without making you aware of the rubber and the paint and the seams and, and all of that. You want the audience to believe the impossible. You have to give them as much possible as, as possible. Uh -huh. If you see where I'm going yep. with this. Yep, the best lie yeah. is sandwiched between two truths. Exactly. If the audience um, accepts all of the other rules of the impossible, physics, gravity, you know, light and shadow, whatever. Yep, um, temperature. Temperature, then you can, you know, get them to, for the suspension of disbelief becomes, you know, possible. possible. The idea was to create an environment that these guys live in that allowed for darkness, that allowed for lights going out right. and being, you know, uh, hiding yeah. the, the stuff, um, you know, and, and the environment where they were uh, essentially trapped, right. you know. It was intriguing to me because we shot the helicopter stuff and the dog being chased and we did it outside of Juneau, Alaska, where we were flown by helicopter to a glacier research camp. We lived in an environment that was very similar. Uh -huh. And it was intriguing to me because, you know, we were stuck there. We couldn't go anywhere. The helicopter had to come so to this, take us away. Did this, did this affect the picture? It, I think it did because, um, first of all, the key crew came along. Uh, it, it certainly gave us all an understanding of right. what it is. and 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 there's, you know, funny things that happen. You know, we, we were told that the guys would get antsy, and pretty soon, cabin fever would come in, which was this oppressive feeling that you were trapped. And you know, so they say that it, it, there would be symptoms at first, like you took my socks. Oh, really? No, I didn't. No. But did you see You're, this happen? Well, no, we didn't. Well, you know, because we were there a short time, and we had a routine, and you know. Right. But. Living through that, we applied that to to the movie, to the movie, uh -huh, to the okay. characters, uh, to the environment, to the lighting, to everything. How do you make it, uh, you know, sort of a, an oppressive? oppressive. 
And now you throw into the mix all this suspicion that not you, no, you didn't take my socks. You're, you're a monster. You're the creature. Right. It's a very sort of real examination of human stuff. We're going to draw a little bit of everybody's blood. We're going to find out who's the thing. You see, when a man bleeds, it's just tissue. My blood from one of you things won't obey when it's attacked. The the sequence with the with the uh, the hot needle and the the blood jumping. Out, I, have, I have a few questions about it. First of all, how did he make that effect happen? Because it really does look like this pool of blood is jumping away out of this petri dish. I'd have to look at it again, but um, I think it's sort of a classic film illusion, which is you build the suspense with each, you know, the hot needle and right and okay this guy's not it and this guy is not, you know now you're starting to think when is it going to happen when which one of these guys have got to be it we don't know who it is i i did a little bit of a a trick uh with, with david the guy who you know is yeah. is the one everybody else i put in what they call an eye light you know, it's a very small yeah. little bit of light, but it reflects in the eye, and it makes that highlight, that point of white, that, you know, that gives life to the eyes. And it's a d very deliberate thing that we do to allow you to understand the, what a, the emotion of an actor and a character. Well, with David, I deliberately eliminated the eye light to give him these sort of dead eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a sneaky a, trick. Yeah. So you know, it's one of those things that, if you go back and look, you'll realize that his eyes are different than right. everybody else's. What was it like when you finally saw that sequence cut together? Palmer now. This is pure nonsense. Doesn't prove a thing. I thought you'd feel that way, Gary. You were the only one that could have got to that blood. We'll do you last. Get away from me! Retreating! What is A, uh, an upside down room so that when David clings to the ceiling, right, goes up yeah, and clings yeah, to the yeah, ceiling, yeah. we are in fact looking at the floor and we hung the, you know, the lamps on the ceiling, we hung them so that they stuck straight up, turned the camera upside down, you know, so. We and now the other effect of a guy literally jumping to the ceiling yeah, so, so when he he's falling to it. When in fact he was just dropping falling. onto the floor. Do you have the pleasure of looking, coming in and going, wow, this is, this is really great to see this, you know, cut that, together? You know, uh, there are certain people who are your friend. Uh, as a cinematographer, you rely on certain people. The production designer yep. to provide sets and environments that you can light or make, make look good, yep. you know. Yeah, you, you sort of go hand in hand. A, a production designer can create stuff that you have no chance of lighting or making look good. On the other hand, you can also ruin, uh, as a cinematographer, you can ruin the work of a production designer by lighting it flatly or not bringing out the textures and shapes and all, all of that stuff. <coughs> so, and then the editor. Providing the pieces. This, by the way, to, these are all paid uh, performers. <laughs> anyway, the editor is also your friend right. uh, or your enemy. <laughs> and you are the friend or enemy of the editor. If you right. don't provide him with the material the material and the right pieces and, and the ability to cut it together with the right timing and, you know, the storytelling that the editor does, then, um, you know, you're not his friend anymore. And if he, you know, doesn't cut together, 
the brilliant things that you as a cinematographer <laughs> have ac accomplished, right. then he can ruin, you know. Your work. My work and essentially the movie, you know. So, so the three of us are really the custodians of the visual image and the visual storytelling. Well, what do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. You move from these, you know, you, you, done, you, you said you did action, and you're, you're known for doing these horror movies now. Halloween, Halloween 2, The Thing. And then you get on to Back to the Future. 